I wanted to speak to you today about the faith of a centurion. And this lesson um, really stood out to me because it's coming in Jesus' teachings right after the Sermon on the Mount. So he does this famous Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, judge not, as you shall be judged, all of these famous teachings of Jesus. And then this is the next thing that happens. And so the buildup in, in that context seems to be important. And we see a centurion, a, a Roman soldier, suddenly exemplify faith. And I, I was fascinated. Like, why is this guy the one that gets to be, right after the Sermon on the Mount, a sort of example of faith? And it made me wonder, what, is, what does it mean for these centurions? Thank you. That looks good, Vic. Thank you. Maybe he's, uh... These centurions in the New Testament stand out as remarkable, remarkable people. And this one in particular, Jesus says to them, I tell you, even in all Israel, I have not found one with faith like this. Imagine if Jesus were to say that about your faith. He's like, I've been to all these churches, all these religious places, and yet your faith stands out. The word in, in the scriptures it says that he marveled. Jesus marveled. To marvel at something means you wonder at it. You're so, maybe not surprised in that he didn't know what was happening, but he just understood it was remarkable that this man had faith. So I want to ask, what was it about his faith that made Jesus marvel? And maybe we can learn something. How can we step forward in that kind of faith? Because wouldn't that be cool if Jesus marveled? He said, wow, you guys really do believe. I'm going to say a, a short prayer just because... I hope that the, the Lord can speak to us this morning. So let's ask Him, Lord, that we can open our hearts just to Your message, God, Your Word. Um, we thank You, Lord, for the Christ who is our Rabbi, our Teacher, our Lord, and we ask for His message and His Spirit to be with us this morning. Amen. Amen. So this, this centurion, um, he's not, he's not a clergyman, right? He, He's not a religious person in that he goes to synagogue. He's not even Jewish, which is remarkable at this time because the Jews weren't really supposed to hang out with the Gentiles, right? In, in Acts, we see that they weren't supposed to go into each other's homes. And so part of what makes this interesting is he is a combat soldier. That's why I got to bring my sword today to show you this is the actual sword of the Romans. Does anybody know the name of this? Gladys? Say it. Gladys? That's right. It's a gladius. And uh, the word gladiator is associated with it. The gladius was a short sword of the Romans. And although I'm not trying to just praise him for that, I'm saying this is the real life. He was a man of war. These centurions, we, we see these men of war in the, in the New Testament. And... They actually stand out as these remarkable figures. The, the centurions in the New Testament are often shown to be very admirable. They do some pretty cool things. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Can you think of some of the centurions in these stories of the New Testament? Could you guys raise your hand if you can think of a centurion beside this one? Yeah. Cross. Maybe saw Jesus. He said, "This is truly is the Son of A centurion has the honor of saying. You know, it's, it's obviously, he's repentant. He's like, this was the Son of God. So again, we see a centurion declare that Jesus is the Son of God. Yet, yeah, let's see, Jim, go ahead. There's a centurion in Acts 10 who sent for Peter. And that was the first time that a Jewish man, Peter, was to baptize someone who was not a Jew. Oh, Corne you mean Cornelius? Cornelius? Yes, Cornelius, one of the most amazing early converts. He was a Roman, not even supposed to go in his house, and boom, one of the first bapti uh, Gentile baptisms, that's right. They also received the Holy Spirit before they were even baptized. The Spirit came upon them, and like, let's baptize him. <laughs> the Spirit's on him. Any other centurions you can think of? 
Think of how many times Paul is saved by the centurions. He, uh, he's often almost killed by the mobs. This happens in Ephesus, this happens in Jerusalem. He's on a ship once, and the ship's going down, and they want to kill him. And the centurion stops the uh, people from killing him there. So, this is just a few uh, examples. There's seven that I counted. I'm not going to pretend I counted them. I got this off the line. Uh, there's seven centurions in the New Testament we see. And they say things like, this, is the, this man was the son of God. This one is the first Gentile to be baptized. They save Paul from, from the hands of the mobs. These men are shown to be men of honor, men of faith even. And so you have to wonder, is there something about the actual role? And uh, the purpose is not necessarily to, to glorify these, but to ask, is there something about their, their status, their training, that would make them receptible? <coughs> And as I kind of looked into this, the, the verse was present on my heart that without faith, it's impossible. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. It's impossible to please God. There's something that when we step forward in faith is precisely what the Lord's asking us to do. Not because we understand everything, but because we are stepping forward in trust with, with God. Just as a, I want to share a quick thing, as I was preparing this week, I was talking with a friend, and this, this person is, in, is struggling with their faith. And they told me that the word faith, they didn't like that word. It makes them feel uncomfortable, because that means you believe in something that may not be true. You, you might be tricked. Um, it feels like a gullible word. Blind faith is something you hear. If we're going to investigate what kind of faith is pleasing to God, I would, I would suggest that we're not talking about a blind faith. We're talking about a faith that is built on the truth. A faith that is worthy for us to follow and believe in. And let's just be clear about that. that. There's a faith where you are committed to this because you know it's true. And we'll talk about it. It doesn't mean you know all the steps. It doesn't mean you know how things are going to happen. The centurion has no idea how are you going to heal my servant. But he's trusting in the truth of, of who Jesus is, and we're going to talk about it, where that comes about. But let's get back to these centurions for a moment, okay? These men are men that are conditioned to be able to launch forward, even if they don't understand how it's going to work. They are calm, bad veterans. A centurion is not an officer that gets appointed by the high ranks and has a fancy, easy life. These men are from the low ranks, and they have to work their way up through combat to get to the point of uh, The word centurion comes from century, which means a hundred. They were appointed over a hundred other soldiers, meaning they were the top one percent to lead these guys. And, can I take out my pointy sword and get <laughs> I'll take this out. I'm going to show you their, their weapon. The gladius is a short, thrusting sword, and... These men had to be brave, meaning you fight at close range with this. And you can see that, that tip. And so, again, if you start dozing, you're going to feel just a little bit <laughs> But these men were called to fight in the front lines and get close. And they would have their big shields and they have to just charge forward. That's how you use this sword, it's a thrusting sword. And if the centurion did not leave from the front, then he could get demoted, dismissed, punished even executed. He was chosen because he could lead by example. And because he could lead by example, he could command and discipline his men. Here we see him with a long stick. This is very useful for teachers, by the way. And probably parents. Uh, when you're lining your kids up. These men led by example, and therefore they could hold their men accountable. Strictly. You stand at attention and you listen to this guy, because he's He's fought from the front. He commands respect. He's not, he's not one of just words. He's one in deed. He leads in word and in deed. They had dedication and loyalty to their, their cause. And maybe this has something to do with the kind of faith they get to exercise. I want to tell you one story that's my favorite from the Roman period. Julius Caesar was the first Roman to really... Um, Land in Britain, 
the island of Great Britain. That was kind of a legendary place. Most people didn't know if Britain really existed. Um, and so he, he led a fleet of ships to go invade England for the first time. And as Julius Caesar and his army approached the beaches of England, uh, Britain, they see barbarians coming out of the forest, and they have spears and beards, and beards are very scary. And I don't know what else they have. They have probably uh, slings as a primitive weapon. But there's, there's tons of them. And as the Roman ships come in, they're in uh, somewhat deep water, and Caesar himself gives the order to charge. All right, attack! This, Romans don't want to jump out of these boats into, it's like kind of a D-Day invasion, right? Normandy. Into this water that's up to their chins with these crazy barbarians with beards uh, going to attack them. And Caesar himself, the commander, had said attack and they didn't jump out of their boats. And so a centurion reaches over and grabs the standard, which is the, the flag, the banner of the legion. He grabs it and jumps out. As, as he jumps out, he says, I may fall, but you better not let this fall. And he charges forward. The banner represents the pride, the spirit of that army. And as his compatriots saw him jump forward, they jumped out of the boats with him because they're not going to let that banner fall. And therefore the invasion begins. That's dedication, that's loyalty. That's somebody leading by example. That's what the centurions had to do. Maybe that has something to do with the kind of faith that the centurion had. What was unique about this guy, though? When you guys read that, that scripture, we just get a little glimpse at him, right? We don't know his name. We don't know where he was from, necessarily. But can you guys tell me, what little peaks do we get into his life? What's, what's going on? You can raise your hand, I'm curious. What stands out to you about his life? Well, he's going to put his faith in Jesus. Let's step back, back a second, though. What do we know about who he is or, or he, his condition? When anybody that's been in the military knows there's a code of military conduct. It's to all his peers. So there's a code. He's, he's following a code, that's right. Yes, sir. He's supported William the Temple. All right, we see a glimpse that he is building a synagogue for the Jews, a place of worship. Yes, sir. But he loves the people. He loves our people. He loves the people. It says he loves the nation of the Jews. This is a Roman warrior. He loves the nation of the Jews. He builds a synagogue. I saw a hand. Yes, ma'am? He recognizes true authority. Okay, we're going to get to what he can recognize authority. Yes, ma'am? He was lucky enough to Okay, let's, let's talk about this one for a moment. He has a servant, a, the Greek word doulos means bond servant, which is really a slave. It's, it's, you're essentially owned. And yet, you say he loved him. I think that, that's true because the, the word there in Greek is that he cared about him very much. He esteemed him highly. He had great worth in his eyes. Uh, the slave, the servant, he cared about him. I think it's fair to say that this centurion, who's a leader of a hundred men, you know, maybe a, how should we say it, a uh, esteemed warrior of the Roman Empire, we find out that this servant was probably a boy, because the Greek word, uh, padia, means like a youth. So he's probably a young man. And we see this compassionate side of the centurion. He's, he's concerned for him. He, at the very least, this code of honor says you take care of those under your command, okay? Every leader needs to have that as a top priority, is to take care of those under your charge. So this great warrior has compassion on this, this, young, this young servant. We do see that he has good standing with the, the Jews, the Jewish people. <coughs> that he can go to the elders. He sends elders to Jesus. And say, please, on behalf of this young man, go to this, this Jesus we've been hearing about. And petition for him. Uh, begging, ask that this boy in Matthew here, that he's paralyzed. So Matthew also tells the story. He has a few more, a few different details. This boy's paralyzed. He might die. So the elders go to Jesus and 
they say, Jesus, this centurion, he's a good man. He's worthy for you to, to bless him, heal his servant. He is worthy. In the eyes of the leaders, of the religious leaders, he's a worthy man. So that stood out to me. I think this is, this is important when we're asking this question of, of going before Jesus. What does it mean to come to him? Is there something that you do that makes you worthy for Jesus to be able to come? Well, he has love for the Jewish people. He funded that synagogue. And I think it's in Capernaum. So he helps build a synagogue. The elders can see that this is a man that is God-fearing, right? The, the Gentiles that knew the true God is a God-fearing man. So he, he follows the God. He's supporting the religion. He's pious. He actually loves the nation. So, so that makes him worthy for Jesus to then answer his prayer? Yes, sir. He has learned what faith meant. He has faith that Jesus can do what he says. Amen. We're not putting our faith in our worth, right? These are great, these are good things. Yes, bless them. All right, so, so I'm not going to ask that you uh, have to build a synagogue or build a church. You can send the offering plate back around again if you want to. But the good news is Jesus will answer your prayers not because you are worthy, because you have faith in who the Christ is. This is an amazing story of faith. In fact, Jesus goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to help this guy. I'm going to save this slave. And he comes to the house, and the centurion is like, Lord, I am not worthy. I am not worthy for you to, to come to me and to even come under my roof. I am unworthy. So that's why I send the elders to you, because who am I to approach you? I think that's a, in one sense, that's a good spirit to have in terms of the humility of recognizing who Christ is, that in one sense, who are we? We are, we are not worthy. But that's not the point. The point is to shift, and this is a, the shift of faith that we have, It's to take your focus off yourself, your own shortcoming, all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short. But it's not focusing on ourselves. It's focusing on the Christ, on the Word. And he goes, but nevertheless, although I'm not worthy, uh, worthy, you say the Word and let my servant be healed. That's cool. That's faith. Notice how quick that shift is. I'm not worthy, but if you say it, it'll be done. Isn't that cool faith that all of you, all of us, we can ask the Lord that way. Dear God, I'm not worthy for whatever it may be for you. I'm not worthy for you to come down, but nevertheless, you said it, may it be so. I, I like this picture. I was looking for some illustrations, and I, I like this one because of the way he's looking down, right? If he's standing in front of his troops, he'd be standing up on the platform. <coughs> All right, you dogs. <laughs> We're getting ready for battle. You know, puff up your chest. When he approaches him, though, he's like, he looks down. That's a, a humble posture. He knows that he's not standing on his rank right now. He's not standing on the fact that he's built a synagogue or that he is loved by the Jewish nation and he loves them. He knows that Christ, Jesus, is a man of authority. And this is probably a key word for us today to think about the faith of the centurion. His faith was knowing the authority of Christ. Now, let's think for a moment about what that word means. What is authority? Authority. Yeah, go ahead. Feel free. Well, shout out some uh, words that you associate. What can authority mean? I heard respect. Power. Power. There's responsibility with authority. That's right. With Jesus, the authority and the power, that comes together. And this is what I believe the centurion can see. He, he describes to, to Jesus his understanding of it. I, too, am one under authority. I get it. I get who you are. I get what you're doing. Because I, am, I have like an analogy. Um, in the military, I'm a centurion. And so if I say to a soldier, go, he's going to go. 
I say to another one, come, he comes. And I say, do this, he's going to do it. Now for a centurion to say this, often his do this might mean attack. Go launch into the shores and attack those bearded barbarians. That's what uh, the word of centurion means. It's not simply pick up your room, clean your room, which is also something that those under authority should do. Including <laughs> <Clean> myself. <laughs> Go. He's, he's, this is to be a life and death command that he gives to you. A centurion did have power over life and death. If he says go and you don't go, he could sentence you to death. Execution. I understand, Jesus, that this is the authority that you have. Authority over life and even death. What's interesting to me is why he thinks Jesus has this authority. And um, kind of coincidentally, um, this week, this last week or so, at the school at Boise Classical, uh, Lori Hancock, who's our uh, co-director, she brought this article on authority for the teachers, because she was trying to tell the teachers, you also have authority in the classroom, and we want to empower them. You have authority over these students. And it's good to think about what authority means. There's different types. Can you guys think of how there's different types of authority? Here's, here's an example. Um, there's an attractive authority. And the attractive authority is you follow somebody and you do what they say because they're um, charismatic and you want to please them. You just, you're just attracted to their message. Jesus had that authority. He was. It was an attractive thing. Crowds were drawn to him. But I don't think this was the primary authority that the centurion sees. We told our teachers this too. We said there's expert authority that if you're extremely good at something, you know what you're doing, people are drawn to that, they come to you as an authority. Right? In court, you can have an expert come and listen to his testimony because he's an authority on that subject. And yes, Jesus is an expert. He knows about the kingdom of God. He knows the gospel because he is the gospel. So he's an, he has this authority as well. But I, I don't think this is quite what Centurion sees either. There's the reward authority and coercive authority. This is the carrot and the stick. Right? Here's the stick. We can follow people because if you do this, I'll give you, what? Money. I'll give you... The carrot doesn't seem that effective anymore with this generation. We need uh, something a little more attentive. Um, but yeah, we'll give you uh, rewards. As teachers, we have to be careful, by the way. It's, we want to like, throw candy at the kids for saying right answers. That teaches them to think externally. That's called extrinsic motivation. Do you do something because of what you're going to get out of that? Or coercively, you better do it or else you're going to get a, a beating. We don't say that to our students, but you get the point. Let's just get to the point. I, I, what I think he's recognizing in Jesus, and I think that he recognizes this partly because of his military service, is that there's a position authority. That you respect that authority because of who that person is, not because of what they do. In the military, they say is when you salute the rank. By the mere status and position of that person, you do what they say. It doesn't matter if it's attractive to you, or if you think that they, you know, the expert, they might not give you a reward. You do it because of who they are, because of that, that status. And I think that this is a message the centurion has for us, his faith. He knows who the Christ is. He knows that he is put in authority, and has command over this creation, over this life of death. Even. And so when Jesus hears him respond with a military analogy, Jesus, I know, I know who you are because I can command troops. What is he saying to Jesus? I command troops. What does Jesus command? about that. Jesus, I know, I know what it's like for you to do this because I, I can tell a soldier to go. Really? Is that what it's like? In one sense, maybe so. Because Jesus looks at him and marvels. Wow, you get it? You get that I have that authority. Well done. It's not because I'm just attractive or because I'll give you manna from heaven or I'll just, it's not just because I do these miracles. You get who I am as power and authority. That's 
the faith of centurion to say we know who Jesus is and we know his power. Period. So I like this. This is the conclusion in Matthew. It's not in the Luke reading, but in the Matthew reading. He talks about many will not do this. And he gives a warning that they will be thrown out of the kingdom. But he concludes with this. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go. Let it be done for you as you have believed. And a servant was healed at that very moment. Do you guys find that interesting that the centurion, to show how he understood authority, the, the word he used was, I say to people, go. And that's how I have authority over them. And Jesus is like, mm -hmm. go. <laughs> he has authority over the centurion. The centurion knows that Christ is Lord. Lord means master over you. He's recognizing, whoa, you are Lord of my life. You are Lord over me. You are Lord over servant. You are Lord over all of this creation. That's the faith that we're shown by the centurion. Go and let it be done because you understand and believe the authority. I want to wrap up with the Great Commission. When Jesus says, don't just be hearers of my word, but doers. Don't say to me, Lord, Lord, and not do it. If a commander says to you, go do this, and I was joking with the class this morning, if the centurion says, all right, soldier, I want you to cross that bridge, tack. I think that's a great idea. Not in the mood today. Thank you, sir. No, that's like your commander. He says it, you do it. You don't have to rationalize it. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to lean on your own understanding. A commander says, go, go. That's the centurion's faith. That's an order from high command, go. Well, okay, but what are the orders? What is he telling us to do? I'm glad you asked. This is called the Great Commission of Jesus. If you call him Lord, he's saying, go. All authority, he says to his disciples, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what the centurion saw. All authority is in Christ. Next line. Now go, I'm commanding you. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe the commandments, all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. This is our commander, this is our Lord. This is Christ telling us the commission. These are our, our marching orders, so to speak. But it's not just like the military orders, this is orders of love. What is the command? Love as I have loved you. Turn the other cheek. You know, don't judge unless you want that kind of judgment. He's trying to teach this compassion. The way the centurion loved his servant. That's, I think that's what Jesus saw there in that, that motivation for him. That kind of love is the inspiration to ask Christ for the healing. This is where it gets personal because we can hear the words, see a lesson, wow, centurion is cool, okay. Now the question for us is what does this mean for you? If you say, Lord, Lord, then we're not just hearers, let's do it. You guys want to do this? You want to listen to Christ? You want to follow his, his commands? If we're going to do this, we've got to come to him and pray to him that we can be faithful as a centurion is faithful. That we can recognize that he has authority, not just over creation, but over our lives. He's our commander. He's our Lord. Let's pray on that, guys. Let's pray that we can follow our Lord. God, we, we do use this word, Lord, so often when we pray. And sometimes we don't pause to really let the meaning sink all the way in. It means master. It means you are the one that commands us. And if we call you that, then we should follow your commands. Lord, as, as we discussed this morning um, in class, following the commands of Jesus is hard. It's a narrow path. Lord, it's, it's not the easy way. It's, it's the hard way. 
But yet, God, that's why we rely on you and your power. I want to pray for the congregation now that we can see who you are, God. See who Christ is, Lord, the Son of God, to whom you have given all authority. And as we trust in that, and not on ourselves, not in our own worth, but Lord, as we trust in who Christ is, we know that all things are possible for him that believes. Lord, let us believe in the power and authority of Christ, and that we can do amazing things in this world. And yes, we can even love as he loved. So Lord, we pray for your spirit to empower us, to, to give us life, Lord, to give us compassion for one another. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.